And so we become the thing for other people that we needed most ourselves. And there is no work that is more meaningful. And there is no work that is more holy. You are, and you have become the defenders of the dead. And I need you to know that there is no holier work. And when you become defenders of the dead, we become liberators of the living. Do you hear me? They would have these families. They would have us be swept under the rug, a thought. For today, gone tomorrow. A mere hashtag. A memory that you reflect on. And that's what it means to live in a society that disposes of people. A society that would just as easily dispose of us. I want to tell you a story. And some of you may have heard this story before. But I need you to understand something deeper still from it. I once walked onto a flight and on that flight, I was late and I stepped through first class and I wanted to throw my carry-on up and a small older man, he popped up and he said, do you belong here? And my first thought was, I could take him. <laughs> but I thought about that moment often, you see, that is what happens when you're dealing with someone who's been told that they belong their entire life. And they begin to think that their job is to make sure that they belong because you don't. Right? And I know because each and every one of you know what it's like not to belong and to be told that you don't belong again and again. In fact, that's what we get told every day. And that's what our movement gets told, that we don't belong, that we're too controversial, too loud. I want to tell you something about what that moment taught me, what moments when we come together like this, what it teaches me. You see this man, he stood before me and in asking me the question, he didn't realize that in asking me the question, he had already answered it. You see, You want to ask me if I belong here? You see, if you have to keep me, if you have to keep me small, if you would jail me by the limits of your imagination, you must stay there too as the guard. That's right. yeah. That's right. Nobody is going anywhere, nobody grows. To ask a question like that tells me something. You see, he has a story about himself that he's come to believe. And we've said this before, if I, if we had accepted the story that we were born into, it would have been to accept our own destruction. You see, I stopped believing the story that was told about me a long time ago. Yes. And we're rewriting our own now, we're writing our own. But I wanna tell you this, When this man stood up and asked me that question, he told me something. You see, I have learned, and not everyone around you has in your lives, but those of us here, we have, we have learned that we were, that we were born into a trap. And you see, to know the trap exists is not to not be trapped at all. But there before me stood a man who had become the bearer and protector of an entity that told him how to live his entire life. And he disappeared himself into it. In fact, he forfeited himself into it. And he's become the defender and protector of an entity. He's carelessly accepted his conditions unthinkingly. He would accept circumstances that would benefit his the body but decay his mind. And I want to tell you something. If the mind is the muscle of the soul, which is to say it is the closest thing to the God, the grace of God that we have within us, if such a thing exists. Then the work 
of thinking for oneself and seeing the world as it is, not as you were told, and seeing people as they are, not as how you were told they are. The ability to think for oneself is the holiest thing that you can do. And the opposite, the most heinous. And against every, every obstacle and every system that has existed in your lives and around us, you have decided to think for yourself. And I need you to understand how very important that is. Because your entire life you were told not to, you were taught to just mindlessly accept the conditions in our society and in our world. And you see, you would forfeit a part of yourself. And I don't know about you, but me, I believed it for a very long time and I had to claw my way back into the living. You, the defenders of the dead and the liberators of the living, the bricklayers of the revolution. And remember that in order to have the revolution, we need to have the revelation of who we are. And so every week, you need to remind yourselves that you're enough the way that we remind each other that we're enough. You see, that's all Black Lives Matter ever, ever was, a rewriting of the story that we were given a decision, a refusal to accept what was given and say, this is enough. And I'll tell you something about what I mean when I say things like poverty is on purpose. And it is, it is a manufactured reality. You see, if wealth was enough, if developing a middle class was enough, black people would have already been free, you see. A black middle class was never what the fight was about. It was never about becoming freer by being as close to the status quo as we could get. The fight is in eliminating the status quo altogether because it has been the people who are oppressed that have been holding her up at the expense of ourselves. And so we said no more. And so if there's any of you, and I'll say this again and I'll say it until we have it memorized, who has wondered ever what kind of person you would have been and what you would have been doing during the atrocities of the past, at the time of the abolitionist fight to end slavery at the time when black people were raising up in this country during the civil rights era, in the Black Power era, if there is any one of you who has ever wondered what you would have done, look around yourselves and look around at each other. You have your answer. You have your answer. And so your job is to go home and to remind yourselves and each other and to remind your families, most importantly, that the only reason that we are on this planet is to live remarkable lives, meaningful lives, purposeful lives. There's no other reason why we're here. And you must remind them that they will be asked the way that we have asked generations before us. They will be asked what were you, what you, what you were doing when black people in this country were trying to get free and everybody else was trying to get free around them. They will be asked what you were doing and you must remind them that their answer should be one that inspires them. That their answer should be one that inspires the next generation to come. You see our answer on what we were doing when people were fighting in this country and all around the world for change. Our answer should be one that makes us proud. That straightens our spine and that reminds us of a resounding cry that we are enough and that we've always been enough, and that we'll always be enough. Because every time we fight, we win. Every time we fight, we win. Every time we fight, we win. We win. Now, with the backdrop of a bigot in the highest office in the world, at a time when all lies are going to be turning to the election, and that fight, I want to remind you of something. 
It is local organizing, local power that changes the national discourse, that changes the nation, that changes the world. something you see we are in an age where everything and everyone stands for something that's why we're all here we have gone through so many movements in the past decade my god we have seen occupy to black lives matter to standing rock to the women's march to no muslim bands the families gone to belong together to me too in parkland we have seen so many movements and there's going to be so many more and so i need you to understand something you see we've got to have some bottom lines some non-negotiables Yes? Are you with me? Can you hear me? So I want to remind you of something. Gone is the time of just standing for something. It's not enough. No, you're being called into something deeper now, something more purposeful. We have got to put our energies and our hearts and our blood and our guts and our spirits into something more. It's not just about what you stand for. It's about who you sit with. It's about who you build community with. And our bottom line has to be that we believe that each other's lives are worth protecting. Do you hear me? Yeah. Do you feel me? Yeah. Because remember, we're a family now. We are a family now. That's right. You see, when you said Black Lives Matter, when you put on the t-shirt, and when you said the sign, when you made the sign, you may have thought that you were just making a connection. Just running a hashtag, no, you are making a commitment. You are married now, you're married to me, to Black Lives Matter, and to this movement. And love is hard work. Love is not easy work, but love is always worth it. And so we must carry forth this love for you, the defenders of the dead, and the liberators of the living. And don't you ever forget that. Don't you ever forget that because there are going to be people who will try to shrink you again, try to reduce you, try to tell you that you are not enough. And remember what I said about looking into the abyss because that is what it is indeed. When darkness is trying to swallow you whole, your job is not to make people see the light. Your job is to be the light. And that is what you are. And I come to you and we come to you as reminders too that we have always been enough, that this movement is enough and that we will continue to grow and build and that there is no force on this earth that is greater than the power that we bring, than the purpose that we bring and that the love that we carry because remember, pain brought us together, pain brought us out to protest, pain, pain brings us on the streets but love is what brings us back. Love always brings us back. I say, y'all, I say, Black Lives Matter. Because we have to, we have to build, build the future that we want to see. And we're going to have a, a, a brother from, from New York. As we said earlier, we're here and we want to make space for the families of those who have been murdered by police violence, by state-sanctioned violence. So give it up for our brother Mark, y'all.